Well, this is Jim, W4JBM. Really, three things I wanted to, uh, to talk about today. Uh, the main thing that things revolve around is uh, a dummy load uh, or dummy antenna that I built several years ago. You'll find sometimes people are picky about uh, uh, whether you call it a dummy load or a dummy antenna. They'll talk about it being a real load. I try to, I try to be correct and, uh, uh, and call it a dummy, um, dummy antenna when I can, uh, since it is a real load. A couple of years ago at a ham fest, I was walking around and I came across a guy that was selling a box full of parts and included uh, a couple packages of these resistors. And these are fairly large resistors. Um, they're made by Iskra. Uh, I, I have no idea if I'm saying that name remotely close, um, but uh, made in Yugoslavia. Um, the type number is UPM150, and uh, at the time that really didn't mean anything to me, but I was able to find later on that the 150 means 15 watts. Um, there's a 050 series of resistors they also made that were a 5 watt series. Um, but I picked up, uh, these are 750 ohms uh, and, and 15 watts. Um, and I had been thinking about making a dummy load, so they seem like a, a really good fit. So it takes 15 of these uh, in, in parallel uh, to get down to, to 50 ohms. And uh, so I had the resistors, um, didn't really know a lot about them at the time, but I, I did some testing and they seemed to be pretty good at, in terms of being non-inductive, so uh, I felt like they'd make a good dummy load. And then I gave some thought to how I wanted to construct it. At the time, I was actually building a lot of projects. Uh, this is just a, a loaf tin. You can buy them um, at like the, the, the dollar store, someplace like that. Uh, and it's mounted on just a, a piece of uh, so one by 12 that I've cut down to size. Um, it has, instead of a connector, I had a cable running into it. And this is a little bit of a, it was a hypothesis on my part that uh, a connector uh, would give you worse um, SWR characteristics than having a, a lead-in cable, a section of lead-in cable. And at the time I was doing this, I had a friend uh, who was trying to do some work with a two-meter rig. I was having a lot of trouble with the homebrew. He'd built a, um, uh, a dummy load similar to a, the, the Heathkit Cantina, where it was in a, a one-gallon drum. Uh, I believed he'd used 1,000 ohm resistors uh, and, and put a batch of them in there. and. Uh, with mineral oil and, and it worked great for shortwave applications but did not work that good uh, as he went up higher in frequency around two meters. So I built this and, and I knew it worked around two meters. Um, and there were a couple things that I, uh, I again, kind of hypotheses that are hypotheses that, uh, that I had uh, when I built this and the performance at two meters seem to bear that out but uh, you never know for sure so on the the base plate actually these are the inside of uh, uh, soda cans that I have uh, uh, repurposed and cut open and, and flattened out so it is completely shielded comes in this is a uh, this little fitting here uh, you can find these this is a great way to bring cables into something with uh, give us some strain relief and you only have to drill a round hole um, and these are found uh, they're used for sprinklers and other things. It's actually a watertight connection. So how I built this, there's a pair of screws on the top that hold these two end pieces of wood uh, in place. And then between them is a fairly heavy piece of copper wire. I brought the coax in, um, stripped it back, and it's actually to about the midpoint. Uh, and again, my, my thinking here was that this is kind of a, almost like a, um, a ladder line or a parallel feed line. Um, and then I put the resistors uh, across here. There's again 15 of them uh, to to get the uh, to get this down to 50 ohm uh, resistance, and and it is pretty much spot on at 50 ohm. It's uh, it's within one or or one percent or so um, uh, of being at 50 ohms. I have, um, like I said before, I I didn't know at the time that these were 15 watt resistors, but uh, I assumed from the size that they were probably more than five, um, probably around 10 or so. So with 15 running 100 watts, um, I've run this uh, at 100 watts uh, for 
for pretty prolonged periods. And, and 100 watts is a fair amount of, of heat, no matter how you, uh, how you cut it. And there is no ventilation or anything in this. Um, and you know, after 10, 15 minutes, it starts to, to feel warm to the touch. Um, but uh, you can tell there's no, no damage or anything to the resistors, even though I've run it uh, at 100 watts uh, for prolonged periods. So um, overall, I was, was pretty happy. So great ham fest fine on the resistors, kind of interesting theory uh, that uh, I was able to test with what I had uh, equipment wise at that point um, up to, to the two meter range and I knew that I had a uh, pretty low uh, standing wave ratio there. So just in the last couple of weeks um, I've got the DG8 SAQ um, uh, vector network analyzer uh, that it comes from SDR kits over in the UK, uh, good from one kilohertz up to 1.3 gigahertz. So this can test a lot, uh, and do a lot of interesting things with it. So what I wanted to do was actually measure the SWR of my my dummy antenna um, and see what it looked like uh, up at, at different frequencies. Uh, so I'm going to put. Uh, Actually, I'm going to turn around and, and look at my screen, uh, but I will pull up uh, for you on the video um, the, uh, the displays that, that show the results. So the first one that I've got, uh, I ran the, the uh, sweep from basically 0 0.5 uh, megahertz to 50 kilohertz up to 250 megahertz. And um, you can see I put some markers in here, but uh, below 50 megahertz, it's better than the, the the first marker there is that uh, you can see the markers up in the upper left hand corner um, at 51 megahertz uh, it gets to 1.15 so basically I'm below 1.15 uh, pretty well below it um, on the shortwave bands six meters I'm looking pretty good um, even as I go up through two meters I'm still well below 1.5 and uh, that marker three and actually the the bottom uh, at the very bottom of the graph is SWR of 1 and the top would be an SWR of 2. So uh, the marker 3, I'm at about uh, 1.5, it's actually 1.51 uh, at 168 megahertz. And so if you look at where this, ignoring that, that very last decimal place, um, uh, if you look at where I, I cross over uh, above 1.5, uh, it's actually right around 200 megahertz, marker 4 there. Um, and again, I've, I've hit that at 3, but then I've started back down, and by marker 4, uh, I'm, I'm going back up, and I remain uh, above 1.5 at that point. So, so I've got an SWR of better than 1.5 up to 200 megahertz, and uh, under uh, 2.0 for the uh, the entire sweep that I did initially, uh, which is uh, 250. So at that point, um, I was kind of curious just how it looked like, uh, what it looked like uh, above 250. So I ran another set. Uh, I had to, to recalibrate uh, the vector analyzer, um, but I ran it from 50 kilohertz up to uh, 500 megahertz. So let's take a look at that. And what you'll see is that, uh, uh, again, I've, I've put marker 1 in here. Uh, it's, uh, things change slightly on this sweep, uh, but basically at 200 megahertz, I cross above 1.5 SWR. Um, at 266 megahertz, I cross above 2.1. But then you see the, the cycles uh, on the SWR. And I assume that those are, uh, in, in some way, uh, related to the length of cable that I have. The length of cable that is on the uh, the dummy antenna is around four feet, uh, maybe three and a half feet or something like that. So roughly a meter. Um, and, and if you look at this, uh, you know, things seem to be spaced out kind of around 50 megahertz or something, which is six meters, uh, which makes me wonder if you know, there's some kind of quarter wavelength effect um, with the way that I've got the thing, the, the 50 ohm load terminated in there uh, that's causing these, these cycles. Um, so what that tells me, uh, or at least uh, I guess another, another hypothesis since uh, the first one uh, may or may not have worked out depending on how you look at it, um, 
But another hypothesis would be that uh, instead of having this uh, four foot cable uh, feeding the, the dummy antenna, uh, I would be better off having something like a, a 20 foot cable or a 40 or 50 foot cable. And part of that is common sense also. And then it's with any uh, dummy antenna or any, any kind of uh, load that's not perfectly matched, uh, you get loss in the, uh, the coax. So I've got a load that is fairly well matched. Uh, if I put a lot of coax in here, I'm just going to lose uh, RF in the coax um, and, and you know, it's going to turn into a little bit of heat on the coax, but not a significant amount of heat. But 100 feet or something, um, I, I kind of wonder if those cycles, uh, if I could space those out far enough um, to get this to where I could use it um, up in say four or five hundred megahertz range. Uh, the reality is I rarely work above uh, the shortwave bands. Um, sometimes the uh, the IF frequencies of some of the more uh, advanced receivers, um, I mean, even like the, the Yaesu FRG7, uh, it's up around 50 megahertz. Um, there's others that are up in the 70 megahertz range or something like that. It's very rare for me to get up above 100 megahertz except for a little bit of tinkering at, uh, at two meters. And I don't do anything uh, really above that. I've got handy talkies and stuff that, that go up higher than that. But in terms of homebrew uh, work or, or experiments, um, yeah, that's it. It really doesn't have a lot to uh, it doesn't, doesn't hold a lot of interest for me at this point uh, anyway. Um, but if it did, I would probably try to build a similar one uh, with a much longer cable. And actually, um, I've got enough resistors to build a second one, and uh, I plan to leave this one on the uh, the bench and then I want to put one on a patch panel that I'm building uh, for the station itself so that I can put put any rig into uh, the, the 50 ohm uh, dummy antenna uh, through the patch panel. Uh, so anyway, like I said, there's really kind of three things that I wanted to talk about. One is uh, great ham fest finds. In Atlanta, the Atlanta area, uh, we had Scientific Atlanta um, and a lot of other high-tech type companies. Uh, you get up to Huntsville, I'm, I'm near it. Atlanta, um, but I'm also not too far from Huntsville. Huntsville has NASA, so lots of cool stuff. Um, so browsing the, ha the Hamfest, always kind of have in mind the little projects that uh, that I'm interested in in trying. Um, I also think it's important, at least to me. Um, I like to I like to learn, not just to build. And uh, so this was uh, it started as a an idea, a concept, uh, a hypothesis that I had, and uh, I built it and I tested that. And uh, you know, I wasn't able to test it as well a decade ago when I built this, um, but I, I thought it was interesting. So built uh, built that. Uh, and the other thing is just the the quality of the. Uh, the test equipment that we can get these days to, to work with. Uh, the Vector Network Analyzer, I mean, this is just, it's an incredible device. And it goes down into the audio frequencies, um, and I, I can do all kinds of testing now. Uh, in the past, what I'd used for this was uh, an antenna analyzer where you just manually tune it, and like every megahertz or so, I would write down what the SWR was and crank it up to the next megahertz. And I could get a curve, but I couldn't get the kinds of curves that we were looking at earlier, um, at least not easily. I could plug it into Excel or something uh, and make a curve, but uh, you know, the, the test equipment's just, uh, it's, it's, it's incredible. This is, uh, I believe it costs around $500 or so, 550 with the, uh, the currency conversion where it is uh, right now. Like I said, it came, comes out of the UK, um, but um, definitely kind of, it was my Christmas present to myself this year um, and uh, definitely to me worth worth the money just in the uh, the kinds of insights that uh, it's helping me get um, with different components different circuit boards tuning some of the filters and stuff that are parts of the projects that I work on and then being able to do simple tests um, on things like the SWR uh, test on the the dummy antenna and uh, right now it's storming outside but uh, when the weather gets a little nicer I'm hoping to um, to get some time to, to get my antennas put back together I've had uh, had issues with the two antenna. I've got a vertical and a, a, a G5 RV um, uh, antenna, wire antenna, uh, and the feed lines on both of them are, are bad. Um, one got mowed and I think the other one's got uh, water in it. So uh, when I get that working again, those two antennas working, I'll be able to use this uh, to characterize them across the shortwave spectrum also instead of having to do the way I've done it before, uh, which is 
again go through and a lot of times with uh, with the ham radio uh, antennas uh, I, in, I just I, I characterize it in the bands and I try and measure it every 50 kilohertz or so uh, which is it's it can be pretty time-consuming so um, some great opportunities at Hamfest interesting to, to try things some great test equipment available today uh, if you find it interesting likes and subscribes are always appreciated I hope you have a great day thanks a lot